All right, tonight we studied Acts chapter 15, the first church council. The first church council, the Council of Jerusalem, 49 AD, in Acts chapter 15, it's recorded. What were the issues? What are the issues that their early Catholics are facing? Circumcision. Do the new members of this new covenant have to be circumcised? Because we all had to be. And it's standard for any good Jew to, on the eighth day, be circumcised. Do we, they have to follow the laws of Moses like we have to? Do they have to keep the whole Deuteronomy law like we do? There's some fellowship problems <laughs> at the table. A lot of fellowship problems. We've never eaten with these people before. We do things different. We stay separate from them. For our whole history, we've been separate from them. We can't even speak to them. We can't sit with them. We can't eat with them. So there's a lot of pastoral concerns, and a council is called. Because if you are circumcised, you need to keep 613 mitzvah laws of the Torah. And if you break one little part of the law, you break the whole thing. You can keep 612, but if you break that 613, ah, it's all over. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. James tells us, and Paul says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it's written, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things, all the things written in the book of the law. Once again, I testify, every man who lets himself be circumcised, then he's obliged to obey the entire law. So if we're going to circumcise all these new believers, then they're going to have to keep all 116, 613 laws. Food laws, what's the big deal? Get over it. No, they've done this for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, kept all 613 mitzvot laws. And they obeyed all of them. The men had prayer shawls, and it's called a teleth, and it means little tent in Hebrew, literally. And they would put the teleth over their head, and they'd go into a little tent with God because the tent was the place of the meeting of God for Moses. So each man had his own little tent. And the little tent, the gematra, the numerical value of the word titsi in the Hebrew, equals 600. And to this we add the eight strands plus the five knots, totaling 613. So according to tradition, you go into your prayer tent and you remember all 613 laws that God gave us. Just looking at the talent would have reminded the Jewish men of the 613 mitzvah laws as Torah had commanded, you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your God. And God prescribed the exact way those should be sown and made. 248 of the laws were mitzvah positive laws, commands to perform or do certain things. 600, or 365 were mitzvah negative laws to abstain from or not to do that. And if you add those up, the ancient Hebrews believed that 248 was the number of human bones in the body and organs, and 365, one for each day of the year, add them together, it's 613. You must keep the whole law, all 613, if you're circumcised. So as to circumcision, they're going to have to keep the whole law if we do this. You realize this. But some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it's necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders met together to consider the matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, my brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the new disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have ever been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will and we will. You're putting a yoke on them. You're putting a heavy burden. What's a yoke? It's a big, heavy wooden cross piece that's fastened over the necks of two animals attached to the plow or the cart there to pull, and it's very, very heavy. And Peter says, you're putting a yoke on them. This is a heavy burden, 613 laws to keep. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. They knew that well from Israel's history in the desert. 
If you don't know God and you're just throwing a bunch of rules, you're going to rebel. If, if you are dating someone and, and it's a blind date and the first time the guy comes over and he says, now I want you to do this, 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 I want your hair this way, I want you to wear this color, you'd say like, uh, I don't think we're going out. <laughs> I knew I should have used catholicmatch.com. <laughs> Dang it. And Peter says, and God who knows the human heart testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And remember, he gave them the Holy Spirit before Peter even baptized them. They were speaking in tongues before he even laid hands on them. It was God. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? Testing the Lord. They did it all the way through the desert, the Israelites. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Is he even here? 613 commandments if they circumcise. It's a very, very heavy yoke. And Jesus, in his own words, said, come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. 1613 laws are a heavy burden, a heavy yoke. Jesus kept the law perfectly, the moral law, the Abrahamic law for all, and he only gave two commandments not 613. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Two, instead of 613. Peter full of the Holy Spirit, says no to circumcision. He has the power to loose and to bind, given to him in Matthew's gospel. He will say no to circumcision because the Holy Spirit said no to circumcision first by being poured out on them before they were even baptized. God shows no partiality. The whole assembly kept silent as the truth pierced their hearts. And then they asked Barnabas and Paul to stand up and tell of all the signs and wonders that God had been doing through them up in Antioch, Syria. Tell us, tell us what God is doing among the Gentiles. And they must have given a powerful, powerful testimony of the way the Lord was working. And all were silent. And James gets the last word. He's the bishop of Jerusalem, the other apostle, James the lesser, son of Alphaeus, the bishop of Jerusalem, a good Jew, an apostle of the Lord. And he says, this agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen from its ruins. I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all other people may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. So James is on board. But, 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 could we just make three rules for him? Can we just make three? Because these three have been preached in the synagogue for generations past. And those three rules we'll go over in just a minute. The southern kingdom does not want to lose their Jewish identity. Jerusalem, the city of God, the city on the hill, Mount Zion, they fought everything against the Babylonians to not lose their Jewish identity. They don't want to give up circumcision. They don't want to give up the laws of Moses. We're Jews. That's our identity in the Lord. We're in covenant with God. The circumcision party is huge in Jerusalem. It's the city of the holy city, the temple. They don't want to lose their identity. They're going to get a time of transition. They have 40 years till 70 AD, one biblical generation to figure it out. They're, they didn't get a book how to start a church. They didn't get a rule book. They got to figure this all out by the power of the Holy Spirit in unity. These 12 apostles and more with Paul and Barnabas. So the first thing James wants them to abstain from things polluted by idols. That's the first commandment. God abhors idol worship. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. The second thing is to abstain from fornication, which is any sexual intercourse between two people not married to one another. 
adultery, one of the commandments, coveting a neighbor's wife, one of the commandments, any sex outside of marriage of any kind, and then to abstain from whatever has been strangled and from blood, because the Jews knew the lifeblood was in the animal. They had a high regard for life, and if there's any blood left it, there's still life. And out of respect for life, that would be uh, a command. So those are found in Leviticus 17 and 18. So instead of 613, we're just asking you to do these, and you don't have to get circumcised. Okay? Okay. <laughs> That's pretty good. They were happy. They rejoiced. They exalted. They exhortated. Their, uh, there was affirmation. It was a big, big celebration when they went back to Antioch with the message, I would assume, except if you were a Judaizer of the circumcision party. Okay? So Paul is in... Italia at number eight there, and he's going to sail all the way back to Antioch, and then here's how 15 starts. Certain individuals came down from Judea, even though um, that's north, they're coming down geographically. And they're, like, we have two parties, a Democratic and a Republican party, and more. They had the circumcision party, the Judaizers. Different translations call them different things. But they were teaching the brothers that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So making the cut. <laughs> Circumcision according to the law of Moses. That's a dull flint knife. That's in the Deuteronomy covenant. All Jewish males, in order to be in covenant with God, in God's family, in right relationship with God, must be circumcised. Thus says the Lord your God. It's Mo they say like Moses was. Moses is from the house of Levi. He and his mother, uh, his mother and father are both Levites. They conceive his son. He was a fine baby, and she hides him for three months. Why? Because Pharaoh is killing all the Hebrew male children, drowning them in the Nile. So she puts him in a basket with pitch and sends him down the river. And Miriam watches from the reeds, his sister, to see what will happen to him. And Pharaoh's daughter comes by, ready to bathe. And she sees the basket in the reeds and says, bring me the basket. And in it is baby Moses. And she says, this must be one of the Hebrew's children. This must be. This must be. She knows with certainty. How does she know? I think she changed his diaper. <laughs> she would have observed the Hebrew covenant sign on his body that he was given on the eighth day, the circumcision of the foreskin, to be in covenant with God. They say, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Moses... Um, is from the tribe of Levi, one of Jacob's 12 sons. That'll become the priestly tribe. Moses, when he grew up, he saw the abuse of God's people, the Hebrews, and he kills a Hebrew, and he buries him in the sand. Now, some Hebrews observe him doing that. He kills an Egyptian, excuse me. He's looking this way and that, hides him in the sand, doesn't think anyone's looking, comes back the next day, sees two Hebrew brothers fighting, and he tries to break that up. And they say, hey, who do you think you are? Who made you Lord and judge over us? We know you killed an Egyptian. <gasps> and Pharaoh finds out, and Moses has to flee, and he runs because Pharaoh wants to kill him. And he flees all the way to the foreign land of Midian. And there he will be watering the flocks. When he sees Jethro's daughters at the well, he defends Jethro's daughters. They take him home for dinner, and the dad says, why don't you marry Zipporah, my daughter? And they do get married, and they have a firstborn son named Gershom, who, which means I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. That's what Moses names his first kid. <laughs> I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. And then that Pharaoh dies, and we know that Moses meets the Lord at the burning bush, and God hears their groaning, and he, want, he remembered that covenant he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he tells Moses to go back to Egypt. And so Moses discusses it with his father-in-law, who is a priest of the Midianites, Jethro. And he says, okay, go back. Take Zipporah, my daughter, and my two grandsons, Gershom, and the other boy, and go. During the night, the Lord meets Moses and tries to kill him. 
the savior of Israel, the one who's going to lead them in exile out of Egypt, and the Lord himself tries to kill Moses. Why? But Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it. And she said, truly, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Ah, then the Lord relented. The Lord let him alone. It was because she said, a bridegroom of blood by circumcision. Moses had not circumcised his own son Gershom on the eighth day as God had prescribed. And God's angry. God's ready to kill Moses because his own firstborn son is not in covenant. So God is teaching through Zipporah, the faithful wife, the Midianite wife. So Mo, she's fully in. Your God is my God. Where you go, I'll go. Kind of like Ruth and Naomi. Moses was circumcised, but his, his own son Gershom was not. So Zipporah took care of that. Circumcision was so important to these people. Such a covenant with God. When Joshua led all those people through into the promised land, the next generation after Moses, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise these Israelites. Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites. This was the reason Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the warriors had died during the journey through the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt. And although the people who came out had been circumcised out of Egypt, this next generation had not been circumcised. They stopped doing it. They stopped the covenant with God. They stopped the sign. So Joshua has to circumcise all of them, and they have to stay in that camp a while until they're healed. So these are adult men that have to come under the flint knife. Circumcision is so important. It's such a sign of the covenant. But it's not just Moses. It goes way back further than that to Father Abraham. Abraham, in Genesis 15, he's, he is, believes the Lord, and it is reckoned to him as righteousness. God is going to do what God promised to do regardless. He doesn't get circumcised until two chapters later. It's Abraham's faith that justifies him. God makes the covenant first. He puts Abraham into a deep sleep and goes between the animals with that smoking pot and torch. And he tells him, I want you guys to remember this. I want you to know what I have done. So every male among you shall be circumcised. That's going to be the sign of my love for you. When you're eight days old, when the baby's eight days old, the male child, you will circumcise him in the flesh of his foreskin, cut off from it. And if you don't do this, he'll be cut off from my people. The covenant will be broken. So you can imagine Abraham going back to his 13-year-old son, Ishmael. Son, can we talk? <laughs> I spoke with the Lord today, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. Ishmael was 13 years old. We have a 13-year-old son right now. I don't know how that would go over. <laughs> Ishmael was 13 when he circumcised the flesh of his foreskin. Abraham was 99 years old. Why does God ask this, this covenant sign? So that you will remember. When Isaac was born, the child of promise, they had him circumcised on the eighth day as God had commanded. So man enters into God's covenant, problem, covenant promise on the eighth day. Through the covenant sign of circumcision, that will be the sign. Man has to respond. Man has to do this. This is man's part. The sign will be circumcision. It's God's promise it's man's response will you obey me or not will you do this or not so every time a jewish male would see this physical outward sign on his own genitalia he would remember he would remember i'm in covenant with god he would point it would point the sign would point to the reality that he's in covenant with god it would help him to remember that he's in right relationship with God. It's an outward sign on his body that he can see. On the eighth day, you will enter into full covenant of God's chosen family. The covenant sign of belonging for a Jew into God's family is made on the eighth day. John the Baptist is circumcised on the eighth day. And then they name him. Jesus Christ is circumcised on the eighth day. The first blood he shed for us, the Lord of the universe, undergoes circumcision so he can be in right 
covenant relationship with God. Now, we're studying how God keeps upping the ante in this progressive succession of covenants getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and how God has gradually been preparing man over time by words and deeds. This is the final covenant tonight. Jesus Christ, the covenant mediator, the sign is not circumcision anymore. The new covenant sign will be Eucharist. The new covenant sign is Eucharist. All the sacraments, really, all the sacraments are visible signs that point to hidden reality. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He's pure white light, uncreated light, so bright we can't even look at it. Moses' face glowed. The transfiguration, it was brighter than any bleacher's cloth. That white light has come into the world, and when white light is refracted, it splits into seven brilliant colors. Jesus Christ, the light, has come into the world, and it's, his light has been refracted into seven different sacraments. I like to think of it this way. Each of those sacraments has his grace contained in them. Each of those sacraments helps us get back to the Father. Baptism, reconciliation, Eucharist, confirmation, holy orders, holy matrimony, anointing of the sick, and confirmation. But the covenant sign is Eucharist. You have to be baptized before you can have Eucharist. But they baptized them, and then they started having Mass right away. In Acts 2, they devoted themselves to apostolic teaching and fellowship and breaking the bread and prayers. They broke bread at home in church houses. St. Ignatius records early on, he lived between 35 and 107 AD, and he wrote a letter to the Smyrnians saying, speaking of the agape meal, the love feast, the Mass, it's painted early in the catacombs. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 is giving pastoral counsel on some of the abuses that are happening at the Lord's Supper, the agape love feast, the mass. A letter from Pliny the Younger to Trajan. Pliny is a politician, a Roman politician, who reports that the Christians, after having met on a stated date in the early morning to address a form of prayer that they do to Christ as a divinity, Later in the day, they reassemble and eat a common meal. It's much less harmless. But this one meal that they're doing to the divinity of Jesus Christ, now that one, we've got to keep an eye on that. As early as the second century, we have witnesses like St. Justin Martyr. I want you to listen what Justin Martyr wrote around 155 AD and tell me if this is the Mass. On the day we call the Day of the Sun, S-U-N, all who dwell in the city or country gather in the same place, the day of the sun, the eighth day or sun day, the eternal day, eternal brightness has come. If you're a Jew and you're day counting, you start number one on Sunday, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Shabbat, Sabbath is Saturday, day seven. The week starts over again on Sunday, it'd be one, but the risen Christ is an eternal day, sun day. The day of the eternal light of Christ has entered the world this Sunday. They're meeting on Sunday. And the day Christ rose from the dead, no more darkness, no more death, eternal light. The eighth day, the eighth day, the eighth day. That's a covenant word on Sunday. It's the eighth day. Circumcision, the old covenant, happened on the eighth day. Then Justin Martyr says the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read. That sounds like the liturgy of the word, as much as time permits. Then when the reader has finished, he who presides over those gathered admonishes and challenges them to imitate these beautiful things. That sounds like a homily. Then we all rise together and we offer prayers for ourselves. Oh, prayers of the faithful and for all others wherever they may be. And so that we might be found righteous by our life and our actions and faithful to the commandments so as to obtain eternal salvation. Then, when the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss. That would be the kiss of peace. Then someone brings bread and a cup of water and wine mixed together to him who presides over the brothers. 
Then, when he's concluded the prayers of thanksgiving, that would be the Eucharistic prayers, and all present give voice with an acclamation saying, Amen, that sounds like the great Amen. And when all those who have uh, presided give thanks and the people respond, then the deacons come, those who we call deacons, and they give those present the Eucharistic bread, the wine, the water, and then they take some home to those who are absent. Sounds like Mass. No longer circumcision on the eighth day. The new covenant will be remembered by Eucharist on the eighth day, Sunday, for all. Every week we'll be reminded of what he did for us. Now, for the Jews, only men could be circumcised. The old covenant of Abraham, Genesis 17, only men get circumcised. If Gentile men were willing to convert, they too could be circumcised. Sure, step right up. <laughs> Circumcision is a men's only club. Women were not circumcised. In a patriarchal society, women come into covenant through your husband. Your husband's circumcised, then you're under him. If you're a slave, if your household owner is circumcised, then you're under his household. But Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 2, he says, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, Jew and Gentile flesh, male and female flesh, not just circumcised flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Men and women will have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. It's not just a men's club anymore. They, because everyone has free will. Everyone has to say yes. I can't ride my husband's coat strings. I have to have a relationship with the living Lord. The eighth day sign of being in God's covenant family changes from circumcision to Eucharist. There is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Jesus Christ. The new covenant remembered by the Eucharist on the eighth day. So these Jewish table laws, if we're all going to take a meal together, <laughs> if we're all going to eat the flesh and blood of Jesus, we need to not have these Jewish table laws because it's a time of change. It's a time of transition. We all need to eat the love feast together. And that kiss of peace was important. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once water and blood flowed out. The church fathers tell us that's baptism and Eucharist, water and blood. But then it took time for the church, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to understand the fullness of the sacraments. There are seven. Seven is the number of perfection, completion, covenant, perfection, covenant, completion. The Holy Spirit reveals through time and the interpretation of Scripture, always under the care of the magisterium, through councils and whatever, there are seven sacraments. They all lead us to Christ. Sacraments of initiation, healing, and vocational awareness. That white light of Christ being refracted into seven beautiful sacraments that fill us with grace and help us get to heaven. All seven are new covenant signs, but the Eucharist is the real presence of Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian faith. All other sacraments and indeed all ecclesial ministries and works of the apostles are bound up with the Eucharist and oriented towards it. For in the blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the church, namely Christ himself, our Pasch, our Paschal Lamb, our Passover Lamb. What is a sacrament? In the broadest sense, it's the sign of something sacred that is hidden. The Greek word for it is mystery. St. Augustine tells us sacraments are outward signs of inward grace instituted by Christ for our sanctification. The Catechism says the sacraments are efficacious, efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ, entrusted to his church, by which divine life is dispensed to us. The visible rites by which the sacraments are celebrated signify and make present the graces proper to each sacrament. They bear fruit in those who receive them with the required disposition. That's what's important. The priest can be in mortal sin when he transubstantiates the Eucharist, and it still works. It's still the body and blood of Christ. 
but what is your disposition to receive it? Are you thinking of your grocery list and filing through the line and not even thinking of what this is? It's our disposition to say, Lord, open my heart. Help me be ready to receive you fully. All the grace that's contained in that piece of Jesus. If we knew when we go into confession, the grace is there. All the sacraments contain grace. When they would receive the Passover, the Passover lamb, any slave who had been purchased could eat the Passover meal, but they had to be circumcised. And when they were aliens, any, if you had any aliens or foreigners among you, yeah, they can eat Passover with us, but all the males must first be circumcised. You want a piece of lamb? Well, come here. No uncircumcised person could eat of it. This new Passover lamb, you must be in full union with the mystical body of Christ to partake of it. I know people who hunger for the Eucharist and they can't have it because they're not in right relation. Sometimes they get angry at the church. They don't understand. But you have to be in right relationship, which means you must be in a state of grace, freed from original sin by baptism before you eat the true Passover lamb. And you must be free from the state of mortal sin. If there's any mortal sin, it separates us from God. If you want the full reception, we need to be in right relationship. The three sacraments, baptism, reconciliation, and Eucharist initiate us into God's family, into this new covenant. And some people say, well, Catholics are so mean that like, at a wedding and stuff, they don't let the Protestants have their Eucharist, have their communion. They can't take part in the communion. That's, that's not very nice. <laughs> but we're, what we're doing is a protection for their soul. Because Paul tells us, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, if you're not in full union with the church, in right standing with God, in an unworthy manner, will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then, only then eat the bread and drink the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. That's why it bothers us when we see politicians sometimes receiving the, the Eucharist and we think, whatever. Okay, <laughs> I won't get into that. Well, I, I, there, when I was searching, I saw President Clinton receiving Eucharist from a Catholic priest, and I thought, oh, I didn't know he was Catholic, but welcome home, you know? <laughs> a visible sign that points to an invisible reality. God has thought of absolutely everything possible. Seven sacraments to help us get back home to him. Seven and we say, eh, I'm good. No thanks. Got it covered. I don't need to go to Mass. I'm good. I don't need to go to confession. I'm good. Got it. I don't need God. I'm good. All the grace that he wants to pour out to us. And we say, eh, I'm good. The sin of self-sufficiency is a deadly, deadly sin. We need his grace. The diary of Sister Faustina. Um, God lets her experience hell so she can tell others. And this is what she writes. One thing that when she went to and saw hell, one thing I noticed that most of the souls in hell are those who believe that there was no hell. So God gives us what we need to get home to him. And the sign the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, help us remember what God has promised and thank him. Adam and Eve had the Sabbath every week, Shabbat, the seventh day, to remind them that they were in covenant with God. Noah had the rainbow. Every time it rained, he knew when that rainbow came out, he was in covenant with God. It was a constant reminder. Circumcision was a reminder to Abraham and his people that on the eighth day, they would enter into covenant with God. Moses had the Passover. Once a year, you must celebrate the Passover of the Lord. Never, ever, 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 ever forget it. What he did for them. David had the throne of David, the greatest king of all time. We had a kingdom. Never forget it. And Jesus Christ, the universal covenant mediator for all, 
The sign is himself, his flesh, his blood, himself for us whenever you want it, every day if you want it, full of grace, true presence of Christ. So Abraham is the father of our faith. Jesus is God's final word. Abraham's covenant was circumcision on the eighth day. Jesus has Eucharist on the eighth day. When it's all been said and done, all people, all people can fully enter into God's covenant promise for all the entire universe on the eighth day if they respond, if they go receive the Eucharist, if they come into communion with the church. Paul says, Jew or Greek, no more, slave or free, no more, male, female, no more. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Now we have 38,000 different types of Christian faiths. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one Eucharist. That very first Eucharist took place, guess what day? The eighth day. It was Sunday, the new day, the eternal day. On the first day of the week at resurrection, it was early dawn, the women came to bring spices. Sunday, the eighth day, the new eternal day. It says in the catechism, the eighth day begins the new creation. The first creation finds its meaning and its summit in the new creation, the risen Jesus Christ. They are on the eighth day walking to Emmaus. It's the eighth day. It's Sunday when Jesus does his very first Eucharist. He opens the word to them, liturgy of the word on the road, and then they share a meal. When he breaks the bread, they recognize him. They recognize him in the breaking of the bread. It's the Eucharist. It's the eighth day, and it's a new covenant, and it's where they recognize him. They have full communion with him, and he leaves. He evaporates. The eighth, it was on the eighth day. That covenant sign is being changed. It's going to take him some time to figure this out. It takes us time to figure this out, and it's 2,000 years later. They fully recognize Jesus Christ when they hear the scriptures, when they break the bread, and their hearts and our hearts burn within us. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit gives us a circumcised heart. We can have a circumcised heart. Way back in Deuteronomy, God told Moses, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and do not be stubborn any longer. A circumcised genital organ is an outward sign of God's promise. A circumcised heart organ is an inward sign of God's promise and everyone has a heart everyone has a heart and he wants our heart circumcised moreover the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul that you may live choose life circumcise yourselves to the Lord Jeremiah says remove the foreskin of your heart Jeremiah is told, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will attend to all those who are circumcised only in the foreskin. This is the day. To those circumcised only in the foreskin, Egypt, Judah, Edom, the Ammonites, Moab, all those that lived in the desert, those nations are uncircumcised. But all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in their heart. He wants our heart not our genital organs. He wants our heart. It's for men and women. It's for every single person to have that heart to heart with Christ. Also on that eighth day, it was early, the first day of the week in John's gospel, when Mary Magdalene sees him, it's on the eighth day. She's in the garden where he's buried. He's in the garden, a risen Jesus. They meet in the garden. It's a new creation. It's a new gardener. It's not Adam. It's Jesus. Behold, I make all things new again. And she said, oh, Jesus, Rabboni. She recognizes him. And she wants to touch him. And he says, touch me not. Touch me not. Don't get attached to this body. I'm going to give you my body in another way, in a way where we can have the most fullest intimate communion this side of heaven, where we can gaze on one another. It's going to be in the Eucharist, the covenant sign on the eighth day. She's sitting there with him on the eighth day. He makes all all things new, a new creation, a new Adam, a new shalom, a new kingdom, a new priesthood, a new covenant communion with his people 
all people in the breaking of the bread and the Eucharist. This is where you can meet me. This is where we can have a heart to heart. Also on that day, the eighth day, it was the first day of the week when Peter and John run to the tomb. And we know John outruns Peter. It's Sunday early on the first day of the week, the eighth day. And it's on that evening that Jesus walks through the doors of the locked room and breathes oh, the Ruha of the Holy Spirit onto the apostles. And he gives them another sacrament on the eighth day. When he said this, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That purified heart, the forgiveness of sins, opens us, fills us with grace, and disposes us to receive the Eucharist in the most fullest way. The eighth day, that happened on the eighth day. This is a new covenant. Now, the very third time, that divine number three, the third time they saw the risen Christ, the apostles, they're fishing on the Sea of Tiberias. And they see him across the way, and Peter's like jumping into the water. And Jesus tells him, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Hey, Peter's a fisherman. He's not a shepherd. What's all this sheep talk about? Well, there's 153 fish in their net, one of each known species of fish in the world at that time. And remember when Jesus said, Peter, no longer will you be a fisherman. You will be a fisher of men from every nation, all men, men from all over the place. God had given Adam in the first covenant dominion over all the animals. God gave Noah dominion over a new creation, clean and unclean animals. God gave Abraham numerous flocks of sheep so big they had to split and go their own ways, Abraham and Lot good shepherd. Moses was a shepherd when he was at the burning bush. He was tending flocks. What is this shepherd thing? David was a shepherd. The next one, the king of Israel was a shepherd boy, a humble, lowly shepherd boy. Jesus is the ultimate good shepherd. And now he's telling Peter, will you be a shepherd? Will you feed my sheep? What are you going to feed him? My flesh, my blood. Will you feed my sheep? Jesus has a universal covenant. The greatest sign is Eucharist, all seven sacraments, but the source and summit is Eucharist. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Peter, will you be a shepherd? Our shepherds, our bishops, archbishops, cardinals, popes, carry the staff, the shepherd's crozier, the pastoral flock, a shepherd's crook. Our pope has a necklace on his neck, he wears it all the time. When I zoomed in on it, it's the good shepherd with a sheep around his neck. And he uses all different staffs. This time he's using John Paul's, blessed John Paul II's staff. That first church council had documents that came out of it. All the church councils have documents. We're just now unpacking the documents of Vatican II 50 years later. That was a four-year council. Paul and Barnabas. Our, and Judas and um, Silas are going to take that letter to the church. They're going to be happy. The ones that don't want to get circumcised are going to be real happy. <laughs> and Barnabas wanted to take with them John Mark. But Paul said, no, 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 no. He's the one who deserted us in Pamphylia. I don't want him coming with us. And there's friction between Christians, between these strong <laughs> Catholic leaders. John Mark had been with them earlier. He bailed. He went back to Jerusalem. But guess what? Mark Barnabas wants to take him. I found out in Colossians that Mark is the cousin of Barnabas. Oh, okay. They will reconcile later. Christians do have disagreements. It's how we reconcile that matters. Get Mark, bring him with me. He's useful to my ministry. Get Mark, my fellow workers. So they do reconcile later. Peter, the first pope, loves Mark. He loves John Mark. In fact, it is this Mark who wrote Peter's record of the gospel. It's the oldest gospel, and John Mark recorded it for Peter. He becomes a saint. He becomes an evangelist. He's very young, and when he writes the gospel, he inserts this in Mark chapter 14 in the garden when Jesus is being arrested, and I'm almost done. Remember the man in the linen that runs 
a certain young man was following Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. Do you remember that? That's John Mark. He writes that, he puts that little part in there about himself. He's young, he's wealthy. His mother owns the upper room where they had the Last Supper in Jerusalem. He has linen, linen's expensive. He's, he, you know, Peter's cutting off someone's ear, Malchus's ear, and he's, he is running away. He's stripped of his linen. He, you know he got out there in haste. He had no undergarments on. He's naked in a garden. He's running away from the Lord, and he's hiding and ashamed. Does that sound like anyone else you know? How about Adam and Eve after the fall? They're naked in a garden. They're running away, hiding from the Lord. They're ashamed. The human condition without Christ is like that. Naked, ashamed, hiding, running, living in the dark. But with Christ, with the bright light of Christ, refracted into all those sacraments that give us grace and aid us on our journey home to his Father, St. Mark went on to become a great man of God, an evangelist and a saint. Christ wants to do that for us too. He wants us to avail ourselves with the greatest hearts we can, partake in his sacraments and find the way back to the Father. And he wants us to gaze on him and he wants to gaze on us in the Eucharist. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise and thank you for the Eucharist, for your flesh and blood that you gave for us. Thank you for this new covenant sign that we can remember. And we give all glory, honor, and praise to the Trinity as we say glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.